It is my pleasure to welcome today Karen Janowski. Karen is uh, known, well known in the world of assistive technology and with her background in, uh, as an OT, uh, she's well known in a lot of circles and they all come together at an intersection today for you. She's going to be talking to us about reaching every writer strategies for sex, success and empowerment. You re may remember we had a session in the fall about writing and the beginning uh, uh, indications in scribbling. And we wanted to bring in a follow up and really inviting Karen to share her expertise. And uh, tell us a little bit about your background, Karen. And uh, we welcome you today. We're so thrilled to uh, get to know you. Well, oh, I cannot start while well, the other participant is sharing. Okay, I do need to start screen share. Well, Deb, thank you so much. It's um, so great to be here with all of you. And uh, I guess both coasts are represented today because you're out on the West Coast. I'm out here on the East Coast in, in Massachusetts. And it really is wonderful to be able to join you. I'm so excited to share because we as OTs and therapists in general have, have a, a, an important role in working with all learners. And so we've got a unique perspective and I look forward to sharing it. I know that Chandra has dropped the link into the chat, but if you missed it, here is a bit.ly that will take you there. It is case sensitive, bit.ly slash writing all lowercase and then the date 111. So um, that will get you there. You can follow along. You can just, you know, whatever you can save it for later, because I hope you find some really practical information that you are excited to share with your colleagues, with those with whom you consult. And so just a little bit about me. I am a, um, a my name, you know, I am Karen Janowski. I am have my own private practice as an assistive and inclusive technology consultant in Reading, Massachusetts, just north of Boston. I recently co-authored a book with three other great assistive technology colleagues called Inclusive Learning 365. And that link right here will take you to that book if anyone is interested. For me as an OT, it's in my DNA. We're all about helping every learner succeed, to be independent, to be empowered, to be successful. And we bring a unique perspective. So I so I hope that um, you'll learn some new ideas and some new strategies and tools that you can't wait to share when you are consulting with others. But that's a little about me. Who are you? If you just want to drop it in your in the chat, who are you? I know that we have, do have a lot of OTs, what your role is. Um, if you're doing any assistive or inclusive technology consulting, just add it into the chat. I'd love to um, to see what others um, are bringing to the table because I'm pretty much just a facilitator. So AACSLP, OT, OTAT, um, excellent. Yeah, just keep adding in OT, OT in the schools. Um, OT, we have an AT team. So great, we've got a lot of different therapists, therapy um, service delivery models represented here. Thank you all. So, so now I do have a question for you. When you're thinking about writing, what do your students struggle the most with? And so if you, I wanna make this a little interactive. So if you can go to slido.com and type and open another window on the side or another device and um, number 3277386, and I'd love for you to add in, when it comes to writing, my students struggle the most with, or you can use the QR code. Let me know what are the, what are the strategy, what are the, the, what are the obstacles that you are finding your learners struggle with? And then add it in. So you should be able to type your answer and then send it in. So just, um, Yep, I can see two participants are typing. So think about that. When it comes to writing. For what... those of you who are might be a little technology challenged, uh, and we know that's just fine, uh, feel free to type in the chat box if you have difficulty there. We want to make sure you're able to get your thoughts out here. Great. But thank, thank you. you. Deb. Mm -hmm. 
Legibility, absolutely. Consistent tools across the school day. Thank you for that first one. Yeah, um, the QR code, if you've got a phone, that also works really well. Let me just see if anyone, okay, thank you, Deb. You're putting it in there as well. Great, we've got, oops, a variety of options. Coming up with content to write about, capitalization and punctuation, visual memory, spacing, forming ideas. Yes, look at all these challenges that our learners have. There's so much that's involved with written expression, literally every part of writing. I mean, I don't know if, if you ever have this, but as when I was an OT in the schools, we had so many referrals because the kids would have breakdowns when it came to, to, to writing independently their thoughts. And so we, we an allowable uh, um, accommodation oftentimes is we'll dictate to a scribe, but is that promoting independence or dependence? Access to a pencil, idea generation. So yeah, see you're running into all the same issues that, that I'm encountering as well. There can be a breakdown in any of these areas. Excellent, thank you. Oh, there's still somebody typing. I, I love when, when um, you have an opportunity to participate as well. And as Deb said, feel free to add it to the chat. Let me see if anybody did. Hard, hand endurance, yes, weak intrinsic muscles. OT struggles with coming up, um, struggles with coming up with own ideas and getting ideas on paper. Absolutely, excellent. Well, thank you all for participating. And we know what the obstacles are. So what do we do? How do we handle this? So, and one of the things too, I don't know if you see this, but worksheets. For some reason, and I don't know why, but for some reason, schools believe that worksheets are an optical instructional tool. And have you ever heard a, a learner say, give me more worksheets, or that was an awesome worksheet. Give me more work. No, no student ever, unless your situation is a little different. So, so let's think quickly, just think about what's involved with the whole process of handwriting and written expression. So a real quick, um, and there's even a lot more. So there's the writing mechanics part of it, which requires, you know, that understanding of letter formation, spelling, vocabulary, punctuation, syntax, all of those things, which requires memory and active working memory. So there's the writing mechanics aspect of it. There is also the writing process part of it, which requires so many more skills come synthesizing for effective written expression. So you can see the ability to compose, to edit, to, to self-regulate, to sustain attention, the ability to brainstorm, you know, so apply writing mechanics. There is so much involved and the breakdown can be anywhere. So, and does, is this something that you often see? She can't read her own writing. So when it's pencil control, when it's um, visual spatial issues, she even though she gets down on paper or he gets it down, they can't read their own writing. Typical, very common obstacle. And this is, um, I love this because when I was in my grad program, this is one of the things I will never forget from the, prof from, from the instructor. He said, spelling is the spoiler of thought. And he said that as an adult with learning disabilities. Do you find, maybe you find that your learners will use words that don't reflect their intellectual or the cognitive capabilities? They'll use words like good or better instead of you know more multisyllabic, more demonstrative adjectives. So because spelling is the spoiler of thought. So that's again, another issue. And this is such a common refrain. Why is it so hard to get my ideas down on paper? We see that often. And there is a reason why it's so hard because the, we saw that quick task analysis. There are so many underlying skills necessary for students to be successful as writers. So the writing process really is involved with um, several different steps. So we think about pre-writing and brainstorming. We think about the drafting, the composing, the actual writing. Then we have to do the revising, which is the refinement. And then we do the editing, which is a closer look. And then finally we publish and that is success. 
So the writing process typically has five steps. Um, I don't know how it is out in Oregon. Tell me this. Have you encountered this magical number of how many paragraphs makes a good essay? I know out here it's that magical five paragraph essay. And I, again, I don't know where that came from. It seems like, well, if you need only three paragraphs or if you need seven, what is magical about five paragraphs? And we're not going to worry about that today. But I, I often, when I'm consulting, I often challenge them. It's like, why is that such a, such a, a protected number? Is some so, let's think. We want to design for success. We saw some of the obstacles. We looked at the task analysis. Let me ask you a question. Does this look like these students are at the beginning of the school day or at the end of the school day? What do you think? Put in the chat. Five is the number, Mike. Yes. Yeah. 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 You think it's the end. Wouldn't it be awesome if this was the beginning of, oh, good. Excellent. Somebody did say beginning. Would, I mean, wouldn't it be the awesome if that was the expectation that it would be at the beginning of every school day that learners would come in so excited to learn and so I'm hoping with some of the tricks that you're learning yeah who are these kids yeah it's a stock photo that I that I paid for but uh, but let's get them really excited about the whole process of written expression and I hope that you will learn some new things today that really help you so I'm going to close that window. So one of the things, a blank piece of paper, how does that work? That can be so incredibly challenging, impossible, so difficult for our learners. So let's think about some things that we can do that can make that easier. One of the things when we think about pre-writing, we wanted the strategy would be let's reduce the cognitive load. Um, I don't know if any of you have read the book by Paula Kluth. Um, oh my goodness. Oh, just give him the whale. Has anybody read that book by Paula Kluth? It is one of the best books if you work with kids who are on the spectrum or you know any type of learner. She talks about we reframe. Instead of thinking about kids perseverating and obsessing on different things, she talks about reframing the conversation and tapping into their fascinations and strengths. So one of the ways that we reduce the cognitive load is by tapping into areas of interest, fascinations, and strengths. So when you think about beginning writing, you know, one of the easiest ways to write is about preferred topics. Do we give our learners that opportunity or do we assign them a specific task? And maybe when you're consulting with your, with your colleagues, you can talk about that. You know, let's reframe the conversation. Let's start with reducing the cognitive load because when there's low risk and it's um, preferred writing, learners will feel more successful and feel more confident. So let's start with their areas of interest, fascinations and strengths. So one of the ways that I wanted to, um, one of the, the great tools out there that can really help in this way is a, an online tool called No Red Ink. Is anyone familiar with that tool? Anyone currently using it? If you are, just, just um, type yes into the the chat because I'd be really interested to see if anyone is currently already familiar with it. And if not, I'm excited to share this with you because, um, so I'm going to take you into No Red Ink. And this is the teacher dashboard. And so I could be, um, so nobody is familiar with it. Awesome. This is going to be something exciting that you're going to want to share with your colleagues. The next slide is really the one I want you to see. It has this interest section. So when we think about reducing the cognitive load, one of the ways that we do that is tapping into our learners' interests. And what No Red Ink does, it's actually a really full featured, it has a free version and a premium version, but it does all aspects of written expression. And I'm gonna 
point out some of the features a little bit later as well. But one of the really cool things is when students log in, they get to set what their interests are. And so some of the assignments are specifically geared to their interests. So look at how cool this is. So here's TV shows and movies. So it has extensive list of TV shows and movies, extensive. It has some of our learners, they can even put in about their friends. They can add their friends' names. They can add their pets' names. They can add, they can, maybe they're into animated characters and superheroes. So they can look at all these choices from Winnie the Pooh all the way up to Deadpool. So, I mean, it's, they can um, even, authors, sports figures, famous people, historical figures, NASCAR, Olympic athletes. I mean, they're just, and in, if they're into video games, some of their um, tasks will be all around maybe their favorite video game. Maybe it's Minecraft. So if I select Minecraft, you'll watch it will go up here. So I'm going to select Minecraft. So see now, and I think you can choose like 10 to 12 um, particular interest areas and they can be customized here look at I just chose Hamilton is one of my favorites I don't even remember what that one is but it was just as an example but how cool is that that this particular website is designed to reduce the cognitive load and tap into learners interests um, that's really a very awesome op option to know about so Think about no red ink as one of the things that you may want to explore further and may want to share with your colleagues because it's reducing the cognitive load at the start of the whole writing uh, written expression process. And I love what you're saying about sharing it, because whether it's something that you personally see working with a student, sharing the ideas, the kids that you work with are going to be part of the classes that the teachers are using this with if we keep mentioning these tools. Right. Yes. And sometimes, you know, people don't know what they don't know. So if you go in and you say, look, this thing is really awesome. Let's kind of explore it together. And then let's review. Because the other thing too, is you've got your data. How are your learners doing without this kind of tool? Are they, you know, like you do your own assessment, what you're looking for, engagement, um, time on task, um, response to the activity. But you introduce a tool like this and you see if in fact it does um, facilitate a difference. Another tool, this is actually, um, anyone familiar with Write Reader? What's, um, and again, put it in the chat. If you, if you are familiar, just say yes. And if you aren't, if you aren't, awesome. Can't wait to show you another tool that you will definitely wanna share with, um, with those with whom you consult. So Write Reader is an online book creation tool. It's kind of like Book Creator, but what's really awesome about it, and here I'm going to click into it. So, and I will log in. And it, um, so one of the things here, let me just see if I've got anything here, writing prompts, um, a beautiful day. I'll just show you this as an example. They have some writing um, books that they already have, but you can see here is, I want to edit this book. So I'm going to go into edit and, you know, it's a simple um, book creation tool, but it has some really awesome features. So for here, and one of the things that's unique about this tool, you can see, you can record your voice. And again, that's part of written expression. It's getting those ideas down. Maybe the whole process of text input, handwriting, whatever is difficult, but you can record your voice. You can add in images. Now, this is what I want you to see about this. So here, the student would write in, and I'm going to write like a student. Um, I see a flower. So I'll say flower. I see a flower and I'm going to spell it. Okay. Flower. Oops. And so maybe I want to say flower and a butterfly. And I'll say, okay, butter, butter, fly. Okay, so maybe that is how the learner would write the sentence. 
And again, it's inventive spelling. We want to make sure are they hearing all the sounds within the words. But what's really nice is then the educator. So your is would write in the would show the correct model and a butter. It's it's respecting the learner's work, but also showing them what the actual correct spelling and sentence structure would be, but it's respecting what the learner has created. And there's no other tool that I'm aware of that does something like that. And I think it's so important for us to respect our learners and help them because we want to acknowledge their struggles, but we also want to help support them in their acquisition of the skills as well. What do you think about that? Any thoughts? Oh, so, oh, Christy, you were using, okay, great. Oh, yes. Okay, Deb, great. Oh, love it. Yeah, very cool. What do you love? What do you think? Do you think that this is something that you would want to share with your with your colleagues, with the um, general educators that with whom you consult? Because that's especially who we want to tap into, not just the special educators, but we really want to make a difference with the, with the general educators. Yes, right, Christy, right? Yes. And again, you can leave feedback. It's just there, there is a free account. Yeah. There's a, I'm always, whatever I show you is all the free. I'm too cheap. And I think we really want to take advantage of the, um, the free features. And yes, they have a lot of prompts. Can this be used in conjunction with read and write? Um, that's a great question. Christy, maybe if you, have you done that? you know, maybe, okay, let me read. Well, the other thing too, is when we read the book, if you've recorded your voice, but you know what, let's just check it out. Can I select the text? Let me see. Oh yeah, I do have the audio on. So uh, we could add our voice recording it, but it doesn't look like it's working with read and write. Christy, do you have any experience? But again, record your voice. That maybe the screenshot reader. The uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, if you've got the premium feature, yes. So yes, we could try that. But our our learners don't necessarily have it. But um, but I, that's when I would record the voice so the, the student could then listen to it. And so if we go into bookshelves too, you can see there's a template library. There are tons of books that that you can get started with. I mean, it's just a, a, so much that's possible with this particular type of tool. I hope you get excited about that as well. So, okay. So those are more for the beginning write, read, writers. It's all part of developing literacy skills. Another strategy, think about providing mistake tolerant options. And again, I showed you that slide about, that was an awesome, awesome worksheet said no student ever. And yet, I don't know what it's like for you, but worksheets are ubiquitous. And think about that. This is this is a concept to try to help learner, teachers understand too. Talk with educators about this. When you're giving an assignment, what are your instructional methods and are they mistake tolerant? And again, that same professor taught me this. Um, this, this was over 20 years ago. This is a concept I'll never forget either. Are your are your methods, are they mistake tolerant? So think about it. A pencil, I have a pencil here. Is this a mistake tolerant option? If I make a mistake, yeah, I could erase, but have you ever seen the learners who erase so hard, they erase right through their paper? And I usually see it at the end of the, the writing block because oh, you know, I tried and look what I did. And so then they can throw away the paper. So it it kind of like is a way for them to handle their frustration in a way that they looked as though they were actually working, but it, it was so frustrating for them that they just kept erasing. That The pencil in that situation is not a mistake tolerant tool. Think about it. When you're building, when you're making something out of clay and you make a mistake, what do you do? You just slap it back down. You start all over again, mistake tolerant tool. But if you're sculpting with stone and you make a mistake, you just keep chipping away, right? And eventually you're just left with a little pebble. That is an example of a mistake 
intolerant tool. So when we think about written expression and mistake tolerant, pencils, pens, things like that are not necessarily, worksheets, not necessarily mistake tolerant, but instead voices, voice typing, voice recording, typing, what are those? Those are mistake tolerant options. So again, the strategy is provide mistake tolerant options. Another strategy to consider is offering novelty and surprise. Give kids, you know, the preferred topic, give them something unexpected. This was actually um, posted. I think I saw this on social media. It was a turtle that was found in Massachusetts that it had, this is an actual picture of a two-headed turtle. So again, give them something unexpected, something that they, you know, something new. And especially at the mid middle of the school year, what a great time to offer, you know, a new idea because they've been going on for a few months now. Give them something new. Give them something different. Try no writing. Try no reading. Try write reader. Something totally different. So that's when we're setting things up as part of the pre-writing and brainstorming process. Now, again, graphic organizers. Brains are very common accommodation on an IEP. But look at this. Is this graphic organizer going to work for this particular learner? Can they read their own work? Can they see the connections? What do you think? Does this look very effective to you? Not necessarily. So let's think about some other options. And two other great options that are free, that have free features that you are Poplet, which is also an iOS app, and Bubble Us. And these are free form graphic organizers. So if I click on the Bubble Us link, so for example, here's one that I started, American Revolution, maybe we have to write something about the American Revolution figures. So I can just start um, adding my ideas. And then after that, so we want to say, we'll say Thomas Jefferson, and so we can move these around, we can color code, then we can connect them and make new, you know, make connections and sequencing. That free form opportunity that isn't as available using mistake intolerant tools like paper and worksheets. So think about tools like um, Bubble Us and Poplet as well. And again, Poplet is online. Uh, I can sign in with Google. And again, it is a free form graphic organizer. So I can create a new poplet. And oh yeah, so see, I can only do one at a time for the free. But here is again, my I can, and what's nice is if you're on your iOS device, you can use your voice, you can type in, you can draw, you can add images. So again, it's really um, these free form, <laughs> excuse me, options. Is this something that you would think about sharing with your colleagues when you're consulting? And I'm just going to check out the chat just in case there's any questions. Yes, absolutely. Could you share the slides again? Oh, yeah. Cannot let go of something they feel is imperfect. Yes. Yeah. So graphic organizers, think about them in a new way. Um, free form and... Again, trying something new. Uh, so embedding that image in it. So that novelty and um, opportunity for trying new things. Okay. And again, here is a graphic organizer. This was actually a learner that I worked with. And again, how effective is this graphic organizer for this particular learner? Let's think in new ways. Let's help change mindsets and help um, help the educators with whom we work see things in a new way. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Christy. Yeah, or in, online, kind of like the mistake tolerant options, definitely. How mistake tolerant is this? The student ended up scribbling, writing over. It just was not effective at all. So this is like an important concept I do want you to, un to understand. And the design, instruction, the materials are the barriers. It's not the learner. We've got to think about how we can remove the barriers to promote independence and success. 
So what I'd like to do now is spend a few minutes um, interacting, giving you an opportunity to share some of the things that you're already using. So we looked at pre-writing, brainstorming, some of those options. Think about when it comes time to actually compose and draft. What are your favorite word fit processing features? And there is a Jamboard, the link is here. And what I'll do is I will grab that link. And, oh shoot, but before I grab that link, let me make sure that I have shared it. Any, anyone with the link? Um, can edit. Yes, that's what we want. Okay, so I'm going to copy that link and put it in the chat. So think about when composing text, what are your favorite word processing features for text composition? What do you always make sure that your learners know how to do? And all you have to do if you're if you're new to Jamboard, all you have to do is go over here this to this, this is a sticky note option. And if you click on sticky note, you can change the color, you can add in your text, what just describe what your favorite word processing features are. And um, so I'm going to say mistake tolerant, just to add that in there. And I'm gonna hit save and it always goes in that corner. And so I'm just gonna move it around here and I can resize it. So. Add in what are your favorite word processing features when composing text? Add it to the Jamboard. Are you familiar with using Jamboards? Because this is a great way to, um, to get everybody to participate who would like to. Word prediction, voice typing, awesome. So you're moving them as well. Excellent. So what else do you, do you love about word processing? The word count, great, excellent. Yeah, keeping track. Ja yes, Chandra, it is a great collaboration tool. Yeah, and it gives us um, an opportunity to participate. And one of the things you notice, it's anonymous. You can add whatever you want. No one is judging you. And again, that's important for our learners as well. If they, we want them to participate but this is an anonymous way for them. Yeah, spell check is huge, right? The comment feature is absolutely huge when you wanna give feedback. So the online dictionary, how about the synonym support using Google Mic for spelling supports? Absolutely. So see, there's so much that's great. The text to speech for proofing, awesome. Yeah, that's definitely something we wanna make sure. Uh, I'm gonna delete this one, delete. Love it. So there are so many features that you're already using when composing text. Now on the next page, let's think about, oh wait, oh, okay. Before we go to the next page. One of the things I wanna make sure, anyone using Google, Google Keep as a writing support tool? Is anyone using Google Keep at all? And then if you are, are you using it as a, as a writing support tool? Just add yes in that. Okay, so what I wanna show you, if this is new for you, this is again, something that you may want to share when you're consulting. So if you're new to Google Keep, Google Keep is a device agnostic tool for note-taking organization, check, um, to-do lists, whatever. And if you probably have noticed over here on the right, I'm in a Google Doc right now. And on the right side, you might have noticed this, this, um, this toolbar. And one of the options on the toolbar is this, Google Keep. So I am going to select it, open up my Google Keep, and look what I have created over here. I've got an editing checklist. I've got transition words. I've got animal farm checklist. I've got pre-writes. I've got, um, so again, this is actually a little bit too much, but I, I show this all the time. So maybe you, you know, we use sentence starters, word banks all the time. So here are some sentence starters. Here are some transition words. Here's some vocabulary for you're assigning a, an essay around um, but not buddy. So you can add in sentence starters, word banks, all kinds of things within Google Keep itself. Let me just see if 
Okay. Oh, um, great. Okay. Yeah, Leslie, sorry you have to go, but I hope you found at least one new thing that you're excited to try. So what do you think about that? What does that currently look like? Because again, we very commonly we see word banks, sentence frames, um, writing frame sentence starters as allowable accommodations or an editing checklist. But do we make a, a learner refer back to a piece of paper or refer back to another window? This works great because it's right within the Google Doc itself. They don't have to go to another tab. They don't have to go to a worksheet. They don't have to pull it out of a binder because again, the organization of those worksheets and those papers that they refer back to, that can be a nightmare for some of our learners. So again, Here's an editing checklist. So uh, lots of ideas for how you can use Google Keep as a uh, during the, the composition process as well as the editing process where you can have these editing checklists. So that's another idea. Um, I have a quick question on the yes, Google Keep. Anthony. Yes. Can you show me, I've used Google Keep before, but I haven't used it with a checklist. Can you show me how to add a checklist? Oh, what a great question. Awesome. All right. So what you cannot do it here. You can't, you, I can take a note, but I can't add the checklist here. So what a great question. Thank you. for. So I'm going to go into my Google Keep and I show this all the time. So here, take a note and we'll just um, call this, um, you know, um, trial. Okay, actually that's the title, but whatever. So here's the note. One of your options you can see, remind, you can have reminders here, you can collaborate. This is the important part, collaboration, background options, add image, but it's under these three dots. See where it says show check boxes. So here is where, so maybe you want to um, check, whoops, check your spelling. Um, listen to your work. Okay, so here's where you could just, you know, hit the, the enter key and then it will automatically create the checklist. And then this is important too, you've got to share it with your learners. So you would add in their school email addresses and then they would open it up and you would tell them make a copy because maybe you're sending it out to a lot of different learners and then they would overwrite each other. So you always tell them, make a copy. And the other thing too is actually, also you want to pin it. And because though, and you can remove pins, but maybe for a particular essay, you want them to see this right away. So show how to bring them back after they've been checked too. Um, so once I, so now I'm going to pin this, but again, I have a lot and I can also change the color. Um, so we'll pin this. And now when I close it and I go in back into my Google Doc right here, it will, since I have so many things pinned, it will be added in, uh, oh, oh, maybe I have to refresh, but it should, uh, you know what, I, it will, did I pass it? Check your spelling, nope. So let's just refresh it and it will be there, except when you model, um, you know, there's always glitches when you model things, right? It was near the bottom, Karen. Okay, thank you. You did see it. Thanks, Sandra. Yeah, so see, because I have so many things pinned because, so it, it typically it's added at the bottom and- And it was right at the top this time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and okay, yeah. And then, okay, so that's um, how you can share it. And again, see how I've pinned everything and I should delete some of these, but I model this a lot when I consult with, with educators. And again, I always want general educators to know about this as well. So is that helpful? So those are some Google Keep tips. And again, I just want to, you to see this. Again, it's part of the text composition, No Red Ink. They have this awesome collection of guided drafts and quick writes. And I added the link. So here you can browse their prompts, but I want to show you, um, this is really very linear, very structured because many of our learners need that kind of structure. So, under the free version, 
They've got argumentative guided draft, literary analysis, or a narrative. So let me just open up the narrative preview just so you could see. And it takes you step by step through how to write a narrative essay. And it's really quite impressive. So here is, let's here add your beginning, the color codes, parts, hook, it's, and SLPs really love this. So what's the hook? Set the scene, hint. So they view the tutorial. So again, lots of guided information that I really believe all learners, all educators need to know about this feature. It's really very cool. So again, another strategy that you may wanna share. Okay, so let's go back. And if we think, oops, I want to go to the next slide. So again, editing and revising, what are your favorite word processing features? You can post it in the Jamboard. This time it's on the second page of the Jamboard. So if you already have that tab open, go to this page two. What are your favorite word processing features for editing and revising? And I did notice like text-to-speech for proofing, um, comment features, those are great. In fact, why don't we just copy this? And I can hit copy, I can duplicate. Oh yeah, but you know what, I can't. Um, I can't, you would think you could bring it to the next page. So we would need to, yeah, text-to-speech, absolutely. The commenting features, absolutely. The, one of the things, is anyone using the voice notes feature in Read and Write for Google? This is something, it, it's um, it's amazing to me how few educators know about this feature. So I'm gonna go back into, um, I'll go back into my Google Doc and I will close this window. But read and write, I think it seems like most everyone knows about this tool. Read and write for Google, the premium feature is always available for free for every educator. But one of the things that I want them to always know about, yeah, they might know about, you know, maybe we'll highlight and give some feedback here. We'll go to the plus and add a, add a text comment. But who's got time to type out things all the time? This particular option here, is anyone using the voice notes for commenting? So what I'm going to do, I selected my text and now I'm going to leave a voice note our authentic voice. How awesome is that when they get to hear the educator's excitement and gate, you know, whatever it is. But so I'm just going to record it. You are off to a fantastic start. I love what you're doing here. I can't wait to read more of your story. So I'll pause it and then we can listen to it again. It's mistake tolerant. We can record again if we need to, which is great. We need mistake tolerant tools as well. So now I'm going to hit comment. And it takes a little bit of time, but see how it's highlighted. And as soon as I put my cursor over it, there now it's something that I can listen to. And again, this is a way our learners could input. You know, maybe they, they have great ideas and they want to do a brain dump. They could use the voice commenting as part of um, their brain dump, like just to get all of their ideas down. So it's not just for feedback, it could also be used as part of the pre-writing process. So once I hit it, you'll hear. You are off to a fantastic start. All right, you don't need to hear my voice again, but you get the point. And then when it's done, you can keep select it. So another option to know about as well, that the voice commenting feature is really important. So again, the Google Keep Tips, this is when I think that editing checklist can be really helpful. And I always tell people, um, listen to your work as part of the editing process. And the reason why that's so important is, yeah, the text-to-speech for the editing, they would listen to it because this is the reason why. I bet if I asked any of you to read this, you would have no difficulty. And this is why the listening to it with the text to speech is such an important part of the editing process. Because according to research, research, it doesn't matter what the order the letters are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter is at the right place. So it can be a total mess, but you can still read it without a problem. This is why we really need to ensure that all of our learners are listening to their um, text compositions before they share it to help them find those errors. And that is, if you're, 
if your students only have the, the free version, they never lose the ability to listen to the text read back to them, which is right here. They never miss that opportunity. Keep notes, take a note. Oh, so it's actually your spelling. Really over here. So listen to your work. So I'm going to pause that and bring it over here and then you'll hear it. And you can tell I've slowed down the voice rate, the reading rate. And here, let me just move that here and close that window and then open this up again. The other thing too, to always make sure that you go into the settings, which is those three dots over here, go into settings and make sure that you have adjusted the speed. It defaults to a, right in the middle. So I've slowed it down for particular um, for particular learners. The other thing is I noticed some of you are using word prediction. Always, this is really huge. Always make sure that um, you adjust it. And I typically, for younger learners, I typically say five or six number of results. The other thing too is the sample size is down here. I just always bring it over to the right as large as possible. And it really does make a difference and then hit save. So that's another little trick to know about too for your learners who are using word prediction built into the read and write for Google Chrome extension. Okay, any thoughts, questions? Then when it comes to, yes. And word prediction is one of those tools that does not persist at the end of a free trial. The, when you're able to read it out loud, yes, that will always stay. So with your students, um, you can add that extension through Chrome, uh, it will appear in their um, tool. And then after 30 days, uh, parts of it will go away, parts of it will stay. But I think you're probably going to say it too, Karen, is that there are study skills tools uh, that you yes. can get out of the free tools. Yes, yes. The big thing is for the written expression is you never lose the ability to listen using the, this is the play, pause, and stop. You never lose that ability to hear. So Sky asks, can students listen even if they do not have read and write? They can because there are built-in tools depending on what device you are using or what. If you're using Google Docs, you absolutely have to show all of your learners the read and write for Google Chrome extension because the quality of the voices, like if the Chromebook voices aren't great if, you're, if your students are learning using Chromebooks. If you're using Office devices, there is the reader, Microsoft um, immersive reader feature that's built into um, Microsoft Word. So uh, I, I cannot recommend the read and write for Google Chrome extension enough if you are a Google Classroom, Google Docs school. And again, customize the reading rate because some kids it'll be too fast. This is the normal rate here. I'll just show it to you um, under speech. The, this is the normal rate. And for some learners, this is, and I'm going to hit save. The other thing too is speak as I type can be a really important tool as well. Speak um, each word for some of our beginning typists or speak on each sentence. So as they're typing, they would hear that sentence read back to them. I'm not going to turn it on, um, but I do want you to hear the difference now between um, the, the, this is the normal, this is the default speed. Trapped. Our family spent last Saturday morning working together in the yard. As we put our tools away, we... So then when I pause it, it stops there. You know, it stops mid-sentence if I need to. And then if I hit pause again, it picks up right where I, le where I left off. If we hit stop, it will start all over again. So that's, a tiny that's an, another little trick and tip to make sure that you tell your learners. And so just... um. The quality of that voice, Ava, is, is a higher quality computer voice. Do you ever recommend the paid version for students? Um, it's a great question. It always depends what is it we want our learners to be able to do. And if there are features like the word prediction feature, the grammar feature over here, the picture dictionary, like maybe they don't know what... Um, what this what this word constantly means or here i'm going to put the cursor here in the middle of the word exhausted and here now i have a talking dictionary 
that will read to me what that word is. I can also use the picture dictionary, which can be really helpful as well. There are some features in here that are really great for, for educators, like the vocab list is amazing and the highlighting tools and the collect highlighting. So there are some other features too. The other thing too is the voice typing. When you use voice typing, it only works in Google Docs under tools. Yeah, so here, voice typing only works under in the Google Doc, but I actually, I read recently where they're going to be adding it to Google Slides. I don't know why it's taking them so long, but, but when you use the premium feature of Google, of um, read and write, you can use voice typing anywhere you can input text. So again, it depends on the, there absolutely are times when we have recommended it, um, but again, it does depend on what the, the learner's challenges are and what we need the learner to be able to do. So what you're describing, of course, is always a feature match. But as a therapist who may be, if you're in the schools all the time, you may know what tools are being used and you, and check if you don't, because uh, many times it's there. It might be a site license that is uh, being used and maybe you just don't know about it yet. Right. But uh, I would. Um, and so it just depends on your relationship, uh, but always recommending the free one to teachers so that it can be a hook. They can see what it can do. Right. And uh, and they may be talking it up to the people who have buying power. Yes. Right, so yeah. Karen, remind me, do we have a case study to talk about we with do. the student we today? Yeah. I just want to make sure that we have about 16 minutes left. And I love right. that people yep. are asking um, questions, just staying on target. So that's why this is the publishing. I did just had this one slide for, for the publishing phase. If Thanks. students are sharing their work with the world, they want it to be good. If they're just sharing it with you, they want it to be good enough. So they, the point is they put a lot more effort if they know it's going to be published online for anyone to see. And I just want you to keep that idea in mind. So think the, you know, we've got the old way, think about the new way and think what the big concepts are. I do, you know, I do hope that you do spend some time, what resonated with you, how can you apply that to your instruction? But so what are your own next steps? What's one new thing that I hope that you will implement? But I do have, this is a really, a really simple case study. Oh, and here's some additional resources. I think you talked about the developmental writing scale with Kelly. And then this is um, a, an assessment tool, the online assessment of writing methods. But the case study is super easy and super generic. A middle school learner has great difficulty with written output and is referred to you for an evaluation. What additional information do you need to know? What evaluation tools would you use? What would you add or change to their IEP? And again, what I'm hoping that we will do is go back into the Jamboard and on page three, here is the case study. The case study is on pages three and four of the Jamboard. So think about this. And, and um, do you usually, Deb, I should have asked, do you usually um, set up rooms so that people can collaborate and then um, add their information? You mean about the case study? Yeah. With, do they usually break up? Do you usually use breakout rooms? We, we haven't been typically. Uh, we, typically presenting the profile of a learner and then ask for input from people what they may and uh, suggest. It would be good, but with it, sometimes it just doesn't give us enough time. Do you feel that five or six minutes is it good enough for people to? Yeah, that's... um. So everybody has the Jamboard open. Let's try, how about um, that we can, can we set up a breakout room? Um, and with 25 people, do we want to do what? Four breakout rooms, five? Yeah, that would be great. And then you can add in, you can talk amongst yourselves and then somebody can be the secretary and can add in because there's not a lot of information, but we oftentimes get referrals like, you know, they're really struggling with written expression and no one stops to think about, well, where is the breakdown? Which part of written, written expression is challenging? Thank you. Thank you. So... 
And I know I, I, oftentimes when we start talking about breakouts, people, the numbers start to dwindle a little bit, but we hope that oh. you will uh, share with other people. And it's not, a, it's just, we're going to go for it because we don't do this often and maybe we should be. So um, I will go ahead when you're ready and I will open rooms. Um, and how long, let's say for uh, let's about. Just, yeah. yeah, let's try six minutes, six, seven minutes. And that people can collaborate. And I know that, um, yeah, I think that would be great. So you can set them up because I, I doesn't look like I can. Okay, so I have it set up. And so I, have you already presented the uh, student profile while I was doing this? Or? Yeah, well, it was just very simple. It oh, was okay. that middle school student has, struggles with written expression. Oh, so okay. It's also... Um, what additional information do you need to know as um, as the consultant and um, what questions would you ask? And so it's on pages three and four of the Jamboard. Okay, excellent. I am going to click to open all rooms, say the technology prayer one more time, please work, amen, and go have some talk. <laughs> If you're not seeing the choice um, down in your toolbar, it should say breakout rooms, um, but it is uh, automatically assigning. And if you see that, just click on join. Ed and and you're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So how were those conversations? I hope that they were some rich conversations. I know um, there was not as much that got added to, oh good, people are adding to the Jamboard now. I mean, because there was not much information in that case study, but very often that is what we're dealing with in the type of referral that we get. And it's important to know what questions to ask. What is it that we want the, the learner to be able to do? What is currently already being used? What is in place? And then we work with the learner and then we make our, our recommendations. One of the things that some of you may be interested to know about is there is a tool and I am going to share my screen again because um, I think this might be helpful. There is a tool that was developed by an OT, the online assessment of writing methods because, you know, I, I don't know how you feel as an OT or as an AT as specialist or universal design, whatever it is. But when we share at the IEP meetings, we get to be we, our, you know, this, okay, yeah, that's who the learner is, but you know, what their strengths are, what their challenges are. But look at all these options that we can use to support that learner to help them be successful, to help them be independent. We bring a unique perspective at the IEP annual meeting. And the online assessment of writing methods is this particular link here. 
And what you can do is here's the writing assessment. I just want you to, so we'll start the assessment. So what's your name? And I just want you to see, so I'll write in, um, and I'll put in I'm 16, whatever. So start now. So the way Bridget Nicholson, if anyone has ever done any work with Bridget, she has handwriting, typing, voice recording, speech recognition, and drawing. So, and you get a report at the end of it. It's a very cool um, tool that helps guide the, the technology or the implementation recommendations that you offer. What I want you to see too is what a write-up looks like here. I just wanna show a quick example of what the information that I derive from that online assessment of writing methods. I'll make it a little bit bigger. So I, you get screenshots of their handwriting. You can take notes. You, the task is write the alphabet from memory. It is a dictation task. You get words per minute calculated. So you get comparisons of all of these different options. And then you get um, on a Likert scale, a student talks about which tool they liked you know, how they felt about it on this Likert scale. So that's something you may want to look into as you are thinking about the types of recommendations that you're going to make, considering the learners with whom you are um, working. And again, oh my goodness, it's 1215 already. So, <laughs> so I would just encourage you to think about what resonated with you today. How can you apply that to your instruction your consultation so what will your next steps be and i thank you so much for taking the time to work to be here today it's been a pleasure and i hope you learned something start with one start with one